Welcome back to Martins and More. My name's Maury Rutsch. And I am Spoon Phillips. And this episode is brought to you by the Martin D35 Ambertone. The D35 Ambertone is the working man's dreadnought. Premium East Indian rosewood, solid spruce top, and a timeless dreadnought shape have made it the choice for pickers, strummers, and players from Johnny Cash to Seth Abbott. The Martin D35 Ambertone is also available in natural or sunburst finish. For more information on the D35 Amber, please visit marismusic.com today. Hey, Spoon, what's going on? Well, what's going on is you brought up the uh, D35 Amber Tone. So uh, most people listening to these podcasts know what a D35 is with its three-piece rosewood back and uh, its unique quarter-inch bracing on a dreadnought. Uh, of course, non-scalloped on the D35, scalloped on the HD35. But um, the Amber Tone is... A lot of people's favorite sunburst, if you want to use that term on a broad definition. And it came about originally uh, from a 1930s Martin that it had a traditional sunburst that had faded over the years. And so they uh, took that idea and basically it's a very sort of mellow, um, diffuse sunburst if if you will so it's still darker on the edges but you get to see all the wood grain and of course uh you know with the classic d35 uh styling i think it's one of the uh one of the great looking guitars so d35 amber tone very very cool and if if you're a fan of this program no doubt you might be a fan also of our wednesday program guitar store virtual tour and i know a lot of you guys have been on record drooling over that color who could blame you? The D35 Amber Tone is available today at Mari's Music. Get it today while it's still here. Spoon, I, I know we're often talking about this topic, that topic, and up to date, if my memory serves, we always find a topic to talk about and bring our friends and listeners something good to listen to. What do you say today we actually call this a grab bag? And instead of trying to find one topic to talk all day about, I think today might be a good experiment. Maybe we can talk about a few different things. Would that throw you off? No, not at all. I'm always game to, uh, to of course, uh, defeat you at 20 questions, and I'm always game uh, <laughs> in, uh, in trying out new ideas for this uh, particular podcast. I'm not sure what you might have to talk about, but I want to suggest something that's pretty exciting to me. Uh, we talked about it at length a couple of episodes ago. You guys might remember the topic, the Martin Backstage and Backstage All Access VIP club. It sort of takes over where the Martin Owners Club left off. Well, we have some good news today. There's an update that the online content exclusive to the Martin Backstage All Access members has begun to drop. And perfect timing, the first episode I saw was when Kurt Russell dropped the Hateful Eight guitar all over the floor after he took it out of Jennifer Jason Lee's hands. Uh, have you seen that movie yet, Spoon? And more importantly, have you seen this really cool footage? Well, I have never seen the movie. I think the uh, just the whole story of uh, that behind that and Kurt Russell at least claims that he thought it was the replica guitar and the director chose not to uh, replace the guitar with the uh, replica guitar, guitar like they typically do in the movie. So they ended up smashing a completely irreplaceable uh, vintage Martin from the 1800s. And people always complain about uh, guitars not being historically accurate in the movies. So this one actually had an historically accurate 12 fret uh, Martin guitar from that era and they destroyed it. So it was an awful story. I didn't, I heard the movie wasn't one of the great movies and I certainly didn't feel like supporting the movie after I heard that story. But yes, this is in fact uh, footage that features uh, the actual guitar with various people from the Martin organization telling their uh their sides of the story and it's an interesting first choice for like you said for the new exclusive content to drop and so i'm looking forward to uh, we're not going to go into too many details about what you get to see but it's uh it is pretty cool it's uh poignant and and i'm looking forward to uh future content 
I agree with the same sentiment. We don't want to come here and actually pull the curtain back and give the world access to what should be only viewed by those exclusive backstage All Access members. But I will go to say that it's a really cool looking series. Uh, It looks like Floyd Herrera from Artist Relations, at least in this first episode, is the narrator. And uh, what I will say from what I got to see this morning, it looks like that guitar was from the late 1800s and it was a, a style 20. And like you said, it began its life where the body meets the neck at the 12th fret. Now the body doesn't meet the neck at all, but it's still a pretty good... It's <laughs> oh, ouch, ouch, yes, yeah. Terrible, terrible, uh, you know, a terrible outcome, and it really is a guitar tragedy. But I will tell you, as an All Access member, I enjoyed watching that, and I do look forward to seeing more episodes coming. Don't forget to check that out at martinguitar.com. Well, I also say I thought the production values were, were excellent, totally... You know, top-notch professional. It looked like the sort of thing you could have seen on, you know, 60 Minutes or, or Nightline or anything like that. So, so they're doing a really good job with it uh, so far. Yep. And keeping the same theme, I'm not sure exactly which video came down first, but on the same page, at least as we tape this in late October of 2023, there was also a cool piece with Fred Green where he talked about the John Mayer relationship the 20 years they've spent talking about signature models how some of them came to fruition and you might remember i made a post a couple weeks ago where martin guitar took some photographs of these brand new gray 20th anniversary john mayer models both the omjm and the om45 jm and as luck would have it before that whole thing came to pass john mayer saw some photographs and didn't completely approve of them he actually had his own personal photographer retake some of the promo pictures but fred does go into detail on some really cool behind the scenes stuff again we're not going to share it here but if you're a fan of of john mayer at all or really of any of the process where martin takes signature models and works hand in hand with the artist that's another really cool short video that's available only to the all access members i enjoyed that too i'm not sure how much you ever heard about behind the scenes with the the way those guitars started and finished but originally without giving too much away I will say what you're seeing on those two models, it didn't exactly start like that. Can you comment at all without uh, spoilers? Well, a little bit. I mean, I've I've been, uh, you know, privy to a lot of this stuff about that. Of course, Dick Boak was the guy that really did the models with Mayer originally, uh, primarily, and and provided John with a great deal of uh, advice. Um, The idea of, of going with Engelman Spruce on the First mayor was uh, something that Dick had actually uh, recommended, and that um, the artist, you know, eventually uh, decided he loved a lot. So it's ended up being the the top on most of his signature models. Uh, Fred was also involved. Fred is quite a visionary and does a lot of uh, um, innovative design stuff himself, and so he was a natural. F- fit for the, you know, the, the sort of the transition from when Dick retired and, you know, and when uh, Mayer was there at his, uh, Dick's retirement uh, concert at the State Theater in Eastern Pennsylvania, we, you know, fortunately had some very good seats and, and could see up close. And, and what I didn't know until after the show that Mayer, you know, Mayer's brand new D45 signature model had just come out and it was sitting there on the stage and he never played it the whole time. He played uh, one of those uh, Rosewood OMs, and I couldn't quite tell which one it was. And it turned out it was actually Dick's personal uh, John Mayer signature model OM, and yeah. uh, and I, you know, I, which I didn't realize. So that was a nice thing for John Mayer to do as a, a send up for Dick Boak. But he also spoke uh, glowingly about Fred at that concert. And I know that Fred has been intimately involved with these new models. As for this particular one, I haven't actually seen that particular video yet. Uh, Will probably later today, but I uh, I do know, so I'm not sure what's in it. But I can say that that I do know from insider tales that uh, Mayer had uh, saw an old guitar that had a, a unique top that had a unique kind of stain on it of some kind or kind of some kind of finish that he really liked and he wanted to get something reproduced that was like that that particular shade that they're using which in my mind is kind of a grayscale shade uh that particular shade is very difficult to capture in photography and anybody who's 
familiar with trying to photograph guitars and trying to photograph guitars that are uh, with the pearl inlay, you can have that beautiful pearl in inlay that's got magenta and fuchsia and, you know, and gold and silver and uh, you know, ruby reds and sapphire blues and emerald greens, and you take pictures of it, and it all just looks gray and silver because you can't, it's almost, it's really difficult to capture those kind of colors. It's kind of the same thing. So he wasn't upset with the photos. Um, he just didn't feel like the photo photography captured the actual shade of the instrument. And so he, he uh, as far as I know, you know, I'm not going to quote any sources, but as far as I know, that's what it was. And, and he didn't feel like it captured the, the actual shade. And I haven't had a chance to see these in person, so I can't really comment on how accurate the shade does look in the, in the modern pictures or not. Well, to that point, I'm really, really close to booking another tour at Martin Guitar very soon, just so I can get the opportunity, hopefully, as you're passing through the factory to see one of these guitars, even if the body isn't connected to the neck yet. I do have it on good authority. It might be time that if you pass through there, if you get there before I do, let us know what you think. You can't share photographs with us because it's going to be the same problem. But if you do get to the Martin factory, set up a tour and uh, enjoy it. Let us know what you think in the comments below if you're one of the lucky people to see these OM Jam silver guitars in production. But Spoon, that's not the only Martin news I have on today's docket. Have you seen the stir that's being caused on the unofficial Martin Guitar Forum over the new Martin D15E? Oh, uh, no, I haven't. So fill me in. What's the stir about this new Martin model that's come out only recently? Why don't you first tell our listeners what the D15E is? Okay, so um, some of you may remember back when the 15 series had gone through um, various changes and for a while it lost the ebony bridge and fingerboard and for a while it was made from a sepale and for a while it uh you know that kind of thing was going on it used to be made with the mortise and tendon neck joint um and the bracing that goes along with the mortise and tendon neck joint which they 15 still have um, and then over time, things changed, and then they came out with the 15M guitars that were back and sides were made from, uh, and top were made from mahogany. This was before they decided to widen the definition of mahogany to include uh, Sepele and Sipo um, as, um, you know, members of the mahogany family, which they are, and, and so forth. So... This new D15E, you notice it's a D15E. It's not a D15ME. Um, the D15M is still in existence. Uh, the D15E has a top of solid mahogany, but it's actually plantation mahogany from India. And this is the first time Martin is now starting to do this. There are many other guitar makers that are doing this. And these are, this is the same species as South American and Central American mahogany, tropical American mahogany. It, is, it has just been cultivated in India. And there have been mahogany plantations in the Philippines and places like that for ages. Now, Martin just has never built guitars with that wood. Uh, unlike a lot of other guitar makers out there that probably just never mentioned the fact that that's where the wood's coming from. Um, and so it could be the argument that there's some microclimate difference and that sort of thing, but the top material of the new D15E, uh, um, which is an acoustic electric guitar, which is also unusual for the 15 series, uh, is um, made with plantation Indian from the country, you know, from the country of India, but it's, it's plantation mahogany, but it is still big leaf mahogany. As for other uh, specs that are different, the back sides are made from sepale. And so in the 15 series, uh, sepale and sipo and uh, uh, tropical American mahogany has been used interchangeably for several years now based on what wood's available when the guitar batches are going through. But this is spec specifically for Sepele back and sides. 
and they're using uh, on purpose really attractive uh, sapele with the with high color contrast in the banding and the shimmery copper and all that stuff. Um, the other major uh, changes include it's got a one and three quarter inch width nut. So in other words, it's the high performance taper and it is uh, made with a mortise and tenon neck joint because these guitars are being manufactured at Navajoa in Mexico. So this is a major sh shift for Martin. And we're going to see whether or not this sells well. That's what Martin's certainly going to do. Are we going to see other uh, 15 series instruments with a plantation mahogany top, sapelli back and sides, m and neck joint uh, made in Mexico? Well, if these things sell and they're priced, I think, $400 less than the dreadnought made in Nazareth, then they will. There will be. But I think therein lies the rub. When you said these are made in Mexico, they have the M&T neck joint. It is fair to say what you just mentioned, that D15s or the 15 series in general has gone through changes. There was a time they were all mahogany. Then there was a time they had to be named M to have mahogany on them. Fast forward to modern day, I think a lot of savvy customers and savvy players who know that up until a few months ago, all the 15 series had a dovetail neck joint made in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're basically using the forum to say, this is borderline fraud, where you're really calling this a D15E. Uh, the fact that you left the M off the name, some readers and some people that are taking time to post think it was a misrepresentation to call this a 15 at all, because 15s are made in Nazareth as you know today's standards are held. So I really think that there's at least half truth there. Or if Martin wants you to know that if you buy a 15 series, you're getting something made in Nazareth, Pennsylvania with the dovetail, that is definitely confusing at best. Some people think it's misleading. I don't think there's any problem, if you're asking my opinion, uh, to make any Martin guitar in Nazareth to save some money, uh, go to the M&T neck joint, knock 400 bucks off the price. I think the thought is not only brilliant, but it's probably going to really fill in the market. There's certainly a need for guitars this good at that price point. But I do side with a lot of the people that think calling this a 15, my opinion is only worth, you know, one point like everyone else's is. But I do think that they open themselves up to this criticism by saying this is a 15 series instrument. Unless, like you said, if very quickly they make a big announcement that not all 15s are Nazareth. Maybe they're going to expand this entire series and it's going to become common knowledge. The thing is, for every really savvy guitar buyer out there that knows this is tricky, there are probably three people that never had any idea where any of the Martins are made. And a lot of people that do know don't mind if they buy a Martin made in Nazareth or a Martin made in Mexico. This argument really only appeals to those people who are you know, dead set on getting something made in the USA. But Without poking the bear or, or putting you on the spot to say something that you might not want to say on a microphone, in general, how do you feel about them calling this a 15? I don't have a problem with it at all. I think Martin can call something whatever they want. I know of no, no big announcements anywhere that says the 15s are made in Nazareth uh, or have to be made in Nazareth to be a 15 or anything of the kind. And I think, obviously, uh, it makes sense to me that they... They're not, why would they go and say, hey, everybody, this is made in Mexico. just want to warn you when obviously they stand by the products that are made in, in Navajo and the road series. Um, this is definitely a change. It's definitely a step. And there was a time when the road series was ma made in uh, Nazareth. They didn't do some big giant, hey, everybody, we're now making these in Mexico. That, you know, it's just not the way businesses work. And so... It's not, a, it's not the D15M, it's the D15. So clearly they're bringing back, they're bringing back mahogany top guitars or mahogany backsides and top from terms of the mahogany family guitars that are going to be uh, less expensive, that are using the M&T neck joint. And in fact, the one thing I forgot to mention, they have the performing artist profile, which I actually prefer over the modified low oval, but that's the neck profile that is used from the guitars that come from Navajoa in the X series and the road series. Um, the 15 series are the most affordable Martins um, that have been made in Nazareth. I will be very surprised if the entire 15 series moves to Navajoa and they no longer make any of them in 
uh, Nazareth. I think this, like the satin uh, dreadnoughts in the standard series, there were people that wanted to get out the pitchforks and torches over, you know, the fact that a D-18 or a D-28 could have a satin finish now, and it still says D-18, it says, still says D-28. It's now an option. Yeah. And now you have an option uh, at the very, you know, bottom end of solid wood Martin guitars to have a 15 that's made in Nazareth with the simple dovetail neck joint, or you have uh, an option to make buy one for $400 less that's made in Navajoa with the M&T neck joint. Uh, frankly, the mahogany top guitars, as far as I'm concerned, are the, the best sounding M&T uh, guitars Martin's ever made were the old 15s with the M&T neck joint. There's something about that solid wood top and the warmth that you get from that top that I think really helps fill out the tone and the voice sounds, I guess, more traditional to me and that, that high end, uh, vibrancy that i hear in spruce topped m and t martins is toned down and so you know i'm not upset about this at all i think uh, there'll be plenty of people who will be happy to have an all solid wood guitar made by martin with martin woods that at this price point and if that's what it if and having it in navajo with the with the uh the lower production costs is what allows that to happen Many people are going to uh, be happy with that. I w I've said this many times, too, when it comes to the people that do this kind of self-righteous hollering on the Internet about these sorts of things, I, I would suspect a very tiny percentage of them would have ever even considered buying a D15M. So <laughs> this is completely not a guitar they would have ever considered buying anyway if it was made in Nazareth or it was made in Navajo. They just want to, you know, Bellyache. I remember meeting a guy in uh, Rudy's, I guess, back when it was up on Rudy Pence's shop when it was up on 48th Street, who was absolutely adamant that Martin stopped making guitars that deserved to be called Martin in 1921. <laughs> you know, and he was absolutely, you know, thought they were, you know, basically garbage after 1921. Well, you know, so people can bellyache about this all they want. Um, yeah, somebody going on here who knows something about Martins is going to look at that. There's nothing on there that says, that, you know, made in Mexico. So, but there's nothing on the, you know, when the, they did the same thing with the Road Series. When the Road Series moved to Navajo, they didn't, they didn't like run that up the flagpole and advertise that. It's just, you know, it's just that it was a business choice. Um, people are perfectly free not to buy it. I think, uh, Will you see people buying a D15 and sending it back and saying, I want my money back because you didn't tell me it wasn't made in the U.S. until it arrived at my doorstep? Maybe. <laughs> um, but I think we're talking uh, such a minute population, both in terms of the, the uh, outcry on the Internet and anybody who's going to be that upset about that guitar. That's the way I look at it. So I'm looking forward to playing one. I can't wait to play one. I'm looking forward to see the new neck, a one and three quarter inch a neck, but with the PA profile. I've been wanting them to do that for a long time, and uh, and I am you know on a on a mahogany top guitar. So I'm really curious uh, to to play one. I'm looking forward to it. Well, that wasn't fun at all. I thought we'd get our Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp on and scream at each other over that topic, but it fell and died. So well, thanks anyway. Well, Skip, I just got to say, I think, I think you skipped your brain vitamins today, based on your opinion. <laughs> Sorry, that's a terrible Shannon Sharp. Uh, heck of a tight end, but... But, uh, I can't scream as loud as Skip Bayless, but believe me, I would want to right now. But let us know in the comments below, if you're following this on the YouTube version, what do you think of Martin calling the D15E a 15? We do want to hear your comments for sure. And there's lots more to talk about on today's grab bag. I know we have at least two or three more news stories, but before we go that far, Spoon, are you ready? Would you please consider playing 20 Questions? <laughs> 20 questions. If you're not familiar with 20 questions, this is the part of the show where one of us uh, has 20 questions to try to figure out a Martin guitar that the other 
a person is thinking of. And this has to be a Martin guitar that's still available for sale today out there in the world uh, from dealers like Mari's Music in Coldale, Pennsylvania. And so uh, this week, the wise guy, uh, being me, has 20 questions to guess what Martin Guitar, the smart guy, which is Mari, is thinking of. And I'm allowed up to three guesses of what model that might be. And those are included within those 20 questions. So do you have any questions before you start, old smart guy? I do not. Let's get this over with. <laughs> 20 questions on the clock. And go. Is this guitar made in Nazareth, Pennsylvania? Does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Ah, I saw what you did there. Um, and, uh, okay, so this is made in Nazareth. Is this guitar a uh, have the dreadnought body shape? Yes. That's two questions. So it's a dreadnought body shape made in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Is this guitar made with a traditional dovetail neck joint? Yes. Is this guitar in the standard series? No. So let's see. Does this guitar have a VTS top? No. Well, then it cannot be in the Authentic Series, and it cannot be in the Modern Deluxe Series. Does this guitar have a spruce top? Yes. Does this guitar have extensive pearl inlay on the top and fingerboard? I'm going to answer that question exactly how you asked it. No. You can rephrase that question, but that counts as seven. Yes, 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 yes. By that, I mean to say it, it doesn't have extensive pearl on both the fingerboard and the top. Well, that eliminates a lot, several uh, instruments. So, uh, is this guitar inspired by the artwork of the famous tattoo artist known as Sailor Jerry? No. Okay, well, that wipes out those two excellent guitars. Oh, I'm sorry we're out of time. <laughs> How many guesses are we up to now? Eight. Eight, okay, so I'm not even halfway there, so that's good. That was, that was hateful eight guesses. Ooh, tying them back to early parts of the show <laughs> and a very painful experience for all involved. See, I was listening. Okay. Uh, is this guitar a six-string guitar? Yes. Is this guitar, to round it off and halfway through, a uh, traditional Martin square shoulder dreadnought? Yes. At the halfway point, I'll pause and ask our listeners, do you know what it is? And or, how many more guesses do you think Spoon needs? This guitar have rosewood back and sides. Yes. Okay. Is this guitar an artist signature model? No. Okay. So it's a limited edition, special edition, Rosewood Dreadnought that does have some extensive pearl, but not all over the place. It's not the fire and ice. And does this guitar have style 45 pearl on the top? Yes. Does this guitar have a bound fingerboard? Yes. Oh, it does have a bound fingerboard. Yes. It has this... You're probably going to be mad at me, and you might think you have the right, but I think most listeners, when this is over, will agree that I didn't do anything wrong yet. But it is Rosewood. I could have stepped up and been a good friend, but I, I heard you do something that I could have intervened, but it's not my place. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I'm almost ready to give up. How many guesses do I have left? You've spent 12. You know how you have three model guesses in here? Yeah. 
Would you like to exchange one of those model guesses for a, a, a friendly hint? No, 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 not yet. Okay. Not yet. I'm still thinking. Oh, good golly. Miss Molly. <laughs> um, Little Richard can't help you now. Apparently not. Did this model come out? Was it released for the first time? during or after COVID? Before. Does this guitar have Indian rosewood back and sides? No. Does it have Brazilian rosewood back and sides? No. It's not a signature. Does it have Madagascar rosewood back and sides? Yes, that's 16. So now I have to really put on my thinking cap. Yeah, now. So wait a second. Uh, yeah, you may, you, I think you're getting really technical for, on me. Does this have, does this guitar have an exceptionally bear clawed Engelman spruce top? Yes. So, this is the fire and ice. Yes! <laughs> You, you know, you almost had me, but you gave it away a little bit. So, in other words, because this guitar is, doesn't have a lot of pearl on it, it has a lot of inlay that's not pearl. So, is that how you were sticking it to me? Well, you had asked me, does this guitar have an extensive pearl on the top and the fingerboard? And I had to say no to that because the fingerboard doesn't. And I sort of begged you to rephrase that question in two parts. Ask me about the top and then separately ask me about the fingerboard. Yeah, because my, my brain was thinking, my brain was thinking, you know, I was thinking like the D200, but you don't have a D200. And yeah, it was like, hmm, hmm. So yes, that was a near miss that I caught up and realized. Yeah, you know, technically I would not call this stuff pearl. It's got all kinds of stuff inlaid all over it, but it's not. I mean, there's extensive inlay on the, at the, you know, I don't know how far up that stuff goes on the fingerboard, but it still has stuff on the fingerboard. But yes, I understand. I was not thinking, I was, when I said that, I was thinking like the, you know, 45, 45 plus sort of guitars. So whew, how many guesses did that take? That was almost down to the wire. Oh, uh, that was 17. But ironically, there isn't any pearl on the fingerboard, which is funny. Just ice, <laughs> fire, a phoenix. All kinds of stuff, but there's really no pearl per se on that fingerboard. But it's not actually made from abalone. It's made from from other other materials. So yes, yes, no. yes. So I was I should have said elaborate inlay, but I did not. So it was nice of you to kind of nudge me into the uh, correct direction. So well, I'm, I'm just a little bit sad that you might be upset with me, and I want to ask our listeners: Was I wrong to keep my mouth shut when Spoon thought out loud to himself? So it's not the D45 Fire and Ice. And I thought, oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but you didn't phrase it as a question, so I shut up. Oh, yeah, that would have been a question, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would have been a <laughs> negative question. Uh, and <laughs> would have been, I guess, that's something I might have held you to. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of he, holding your feet to the fire and ice. Um, ah. So, well, that was, that, was, that was very difficult. Congratulations. That was really, that was really hard. I'm proud of you. You know that. I hope you do. I'm really sorry you didn't guess it in 10, because if you would have, you would have won the D45 Fire and Ice. Hey-o! <laughs> so the, for Too those bad. people who are not familiar with this insanely beautiful guitar, uh, over the over the top uh, inlay by Harvey Leach, and the famous inlay artist, and uh, basically taking, I think, possibly Chinese mythology, I don't remember now, um, but you know, sort of a yin yang thing between the phoenix and the and the dragon, uh, but it's a but it's an ice dragon. It's not a typical fire breathing dragon. It's an ice dragon. But anyway, you guys should check it out, uh, particularly if you are a collector of an exquisite luthery and and guitars as a work of art. Um, and I've I've been allowed to play this thing, and it's it's you know it sounds it sounds worthy of the price tag and of the amazing uh, inlay on it. So whew, I feel much better. 
I need a cup of tea. Well, that was fun. And those of you guys <laughs> who are in the accounting world, it's almost going to be the end of our fiscal year. I don't want to count that guitar in inventory. Please call me and make me an offer on the Martin Guitar Fire and Ice. Ooh. Ooh. All right, Spoon, I've been hogging the show. Do you have any news items you want to share with us today on the grab bag? Um, oh, I guess I can uh, cough up some news uh, uh, regarding the the uh, the Woodstock Guitar Festival, which I, again, was not able to attend, but that just happened. And uh, they have all kinds of really cool instruments um, by independent builders. And I know Dick Boak was up there. He loves to go up there and hang out with all the people and many, many of his old friends. And this year was very special because Linda, Linda Manzer, the uh, Canadian luthier, uh, they were having a, a special presentation. And she gave a presentation, as I understand it, of her 50th year retrospective on her uh, 50 years as a guitar maker. She's an absolutely wonderful person. Um, there was there's something absolutely magical about her. I, I call her a wood charmer. And, you know, I was absolutely smitten with her as a person when I first met her at, at one of the guitar shows. And some people may remember as a, as a young woman, she uh, managed to, I don't know how she got in there, but she managed to get into Pat Matheny's hotel after a show, uh, probably in Toronto or someplace like that, and showed him a couple of her guitars or at least one of his her guitars and which just completely blew him away and and he immediately you know uh started having guitars and he's had multiple mansers made um <laughs> and really helped launch her you know her uh career much in the same way that james taylor did with uh jim olson in terms of popularizing their uh the art artisan's work but uh so good for her um she is you know um, I don't know if she's officially retired, but I think so because I think, I think, uh, you know, this that's kind of part of this 50th retrospective. But uh, wonderful person, amazing luthier, and uh, so shout out to uh, to Linda and to Dick. Uh, I know uh, you've always had a great time going up there, and I just look forward to your stories, which reminds me, uh, Dick Boak ha- is. Uh, has put out a book recently that is actually just filled with uh, little short uh, excerpts. Um, they're not really excerpts, but they are little short uh, stories. Most of them really funny um, um, from all sorts <laughs> of guitar makers out there, and uh, and uh, and you know people within the guitar making world uh, about just you know. From the from the hilarious to the downright uh, uh, almost unbelievable stories, and so you guys want to check it out. I'm afraid I'm having a a moment. I cannot remember the name of it, but um, but uh, he he you know collaborated on this book with other people, and and I highly recommend it if you have uh, interest in guitars and and funny stories because it's. Uh, uh, this is exactly the kind of place up at the Woodstock Festival where those stories get traded around. I think that's probably has a lot to do with why the book came out. But uh, <laughs> so that's, I guess, my news from the field, though I couldn't be in that particular field this year. That's a good point. I bet you there's another book being written right now, including some of the stuff we missed at the Woodstock show. Another thing worth mentioning on today's newscast, uh, Martin's been putting up a lot of great footage Uh, Little stories, little pictures and videos all over their Facebook and Instagram accounts. This year is going to commemorate the 190th anniversary. And Martin is bringing a lot of different footage uh, to both of those platforms. So if you're one of those people who's active on social media, if you're still not following Martin on Instagram or Facebook, you need to start doing that soon. Because every time I turn my phone on and flip around looking for something guitar related, I'm seeing another little tidbit. Uh, something I saw this morning has probably been up over a week now. The D28 and the D18 were the first two Martin guitars back in the 20s. And it's just little things like that. I know a lot of our listeners would probably see these stories and recognize the facts before they're really seeing them for the first time. But if you just need a little bit more Martin in your life and you want to you know, look at your phone and see something positive, uh, give them a follow on social media because this year especially 
uh, most definitely in the last few weeks. They're putting some really cool stuff up there, a lot of stuff from the museum. I know Jason Arner is in a couple of videos and pictures. Uh, you can't ever get enough Martin content. And after you listen to this show, uh, keep your phone in your hand and go in that direction because they're always putting some good stuff up. Speaking of Martins and more, that's a whole lot of Martins. Let me get some more out of Spoon Phillips. You owe us another installment of Top 10 Reasons to Buy a Blue Ridge Guitar. Well, yes, I do. I apologize. You know, I originally thought I was going to do these top 10 reasons across 10 uh, consecutive episodes, but sometimes our shows go long. Sometimes we just get uh, distracted and forget. Um, and so I'm just saying uh, we've heard from, from various readers uh, uh, at times about that. But uh, we're all the way up to the number two reason, Spoon's number two reason for buying or owning a Blue Ridge guitar. Tone, tone, tone. So the number two reason, of course, is the Blue Ridge tone. And when it really comes down to guitars, that's what's most important to me is tone. And, of course, playability really matters. I'm definitely at the point in my life where there's guitars I would love to own and play but can't because I just can't take those necks. So that is important. But all things considered, uh, it's Martin Tone and Blue Ridge Tone that make Maury's music uh, sell those guitars and only those guitars. And Blue Ridge offers uh, its own tone, but it's still in a very traditional Martin-esque vein. And for the money, it's really hard to find tone that's as enjoyable and satisfying as you get out of Blue Ridge. Um, whether you like the uh, Rosewood complexity and the extra warmth that you get down in the bottom end and how that can permeate up into the uh, uh, all the way up into the trebles when you're dealing with traditional dovetail neck joint guitars or if you like that more streamlined uh, mahogany tone uh, that puts a lot of the emphasis on on the uh, woodiness and the the high end chime of a spruce top it's hard to argue about where people need to turn to when they're looking for uh, something within their budget that uh, has a, some overlap into the martin line but by and large is a a, a significant uh, bargain for what you get in an all solid wood guitar made by master crafts people using traditional methods uh four shifted scallop bracing you have different, you know, of course, I've spoken in the past about the different neck shapes and, and neck sizes and some advantages you can find there, particularly if you're looking for uh, a neck that's narrower than uh, uh, typical Martin necks or if you're looking for a V-neck uh, guitar like a ex very expensive Martin for a lot less money and all that. So that's my number two reason to own a Blue Ridge, the Blue Ridge tried and true tone. Well, thank you, Spoon. I couldn't have said it better myself, and that's part of the reason I don't do this show alone. <laughs> and also, when I can correct you, you said something about uh, the stuff on the Martin website, and you referred to the D28 and the D20, uh, D18 in the 1920s, which, of course, they came out in the 1930s, so everybody <gasps> knows that. The, the, uh, um, but <laughs> oh... But that's um, the other reason I don't do this show alone. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but the the original Dreadnought, of course, was made for the Ditson uh, department stores, the musical department stores, and um, it wasn't until uh, Ditson went bankrupt during the Great Depression that Martin uh, brought the Dreadnought out under their own brand, and that was in 1931 with the D1 and the D2 that quickly became the D18 and D28, and in 1934. They were converted to the traditional uh, 14 fret dreadnought that we know of today. But I just put it out there for all the people who are about, who are furiously typing away right now on the YouTube version of this podcast <laughs> to call uh, Maury out on his accidentally saying 1920s instead of 1930s. Um, so you're welcome. <laughs> Damn it, Janet. I had everything else right about today. I, I knew I was going to say 1970. I knew that was wrong. 
Well, I have an extra credit question for you, Spoon, before we wrap things up. I do want to thank all of our listeners for listening. A couple months ago, I was going to ask you, and maybe I even did, what are some of your favorite podcasts when it comes to acoustic guitar? I want to ask you and the listener today, name your current favorite podcast that you're listening to these days that's not about guitars or music. Well, that's interesting. Lately, I haven't really had time. I've been focusing more on audiobooks and, and typically history stuff, but that's what I like to listen to. I like to listen to uh, stuff uh, connected to the Smithsonian. And so, I, you know, I'm, uh, if I'm not listening to fiction in terms of audiobooks, um, my podcasts tend to be more related to uh, history, archaeology, you know, cosmology, that, you know, science and history kind of stuff. That's what, what I listen to. And so I would always point people to uh, Smithsonian and some of the NPR stuff. Interesting. How about you? This time of year, you guys might know that I'm a really huge fan of New England and the New England charm. I'm also very emotionally attached to Cape Cod and Salem. Back in 1998, Lori and I honeymooned in Falmouth, Massachusetts. And ever since then, with the exception of maybe one year here or there, we've gone back there every single fall, whether it was Cape Cod, Salem, Plymouth, all those places. And in the last 10 years, probably Salem and Cape Cod more than anything, there's a podcast called Salem, the podcast. And I was browsing Facebook a couple months ago, and they actually interviewed the captain of the Schooner Fame. That was my introduction to that podcast. And ever since I've found that, I just I latched right onto it. So if you're into that kind of thing, if you like spooky stories and you like Salem in general, check out Salem the Podcast. It's done by two tour guides, Jeffrey and Sarah. So they spend their, their days and evenings walking through the streets of Salem with tours, and then they take one day out of the week and actually produce a really cool podcast. So if that's your thing, uh, that's what I've been listening to a lot lately. And well, I'll that's probably... fascinating. I, I'm glad you told me about that. That's very apt for Halloween, a podcast about Salem, Massachusetts. And as, as for your honeymoon and stuff like that, you know, I've, I, I've actually, you know, known some uh, people from Massachusetts that are pretty foul-mouthed. Uh, so I'm, I understand why they have a city up there called Foulmouth, Massachusetts. <laughs> Yes, beautiful foul mouth. I, I, I close my eyes and I'm back there in 1998. We just walking up and down the streets talking like sailors, Spoon. <laughs> Couldn't resist, sorry. Um, <laughs> but yes, I enjoy hearing your story, seeing your photos. I, of course, I'm a huge fan of your song that was inspired by your the two of you's journey um and uh, and how it started back Thank there you. and going up there to uh, massachusetts and it's interesting massachusetts charm uh i thought for a second when you said you liked massachusetts charm i thought maybe that was like a wnba team or a major league soccer team or something <laughs> it kind of sounds that way maybe a, oh maybe spoon, a, you know when it comes to the wnba <laughs> don't make me choose they're all my favorite Oh, well, there you go. Or maybe even <laughs> lacrosse. You know, lacrosse, New England's one of the few places where lacrosse is big enough that they actually have, you know, professional lacrosse teams. So, so <laughs> the New England Charm, I could totally see that as a, as a team name. Well, if you're still listening, you made it this far. We kept it on the rails as long as we could. It fell right <laughs> off for a few minutes, but uh, it, it's always, hey, if, if anything, it's always conversational. We don't want to get into the rut where we overscript anything here, and we're just going to be two guys talking. Uh, but it was Martins and more, and you got Martins, you got a little bit of Blue Ridge, and you even got a tiny bit of WNBA. What more could you ask for in your favorite <laughs> podcast these days? I bet you listen to Sale in the Podcast. They don't talk about us or the WNBA, or maybe they do. <laughs> we'll have to listen and see. All right. Well, from all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. <laughs>